Hello and welcome back to An Old Man Watches and I need to begin today's video with a content warning. Uh, the film that I'm discussing today is a deliberately provocative one with unpleasant content. Um, it includes real-life animal cruelty uh, as well as multiple other deliberately gross or offensive scenes um, and also uh, somewhat more prosaically but still I know an issue for some people live snakes uh, doing snake things I'll be addressing all of this content in more detail later because it's a significant element of the film and it can't just be ignored uh, but you know I mean if you've already decided based on that that this is not your kind of movie you should probably stop the video now uh, assuming you're still with me, the film in question is the 1978 sleeve extravaganza Slave of the Cannibal God, uh, which has a number of alternative titles, including Mountain of the Cannibal God, Prisoner of the Cannibal God, and Primitive Desires. Uh, and at its outset, uh, the film establishes its viewpoint that New Guinea is a wild and untamed land. Uh, and it also establishes that a wealthy woman has come looking for her missing husband. Uh, the husband trekked out in the wilderness, you see, and, and hasn't been seen since. Uh, together with an old colleague of, a hus of her husband, uh, plus a bunch of disposable extras, uh, she sets off to find the missing man. That then follows lots of frankly quite tedious struggles through the wilderness, uh, places that could probably be quite beautiful if shot in a more interesting fashion, uh, while occasionally losing one of their number to traps, crocodiles or natives in scary masks. Uh, after the group has been significantly whittled down in number, they finally meet some friendly faces, pick up some extra recruits. Uh, they also learn slowly, and we learn probably more than the, than the cast do, that there's more to this expedition than just looking for somebody's missing husband. Uh, alas for the characters, but blessedly for the audience, since it means the movie is nearly over, this is when the cannibals turn up, fully intent on killing and eating everybody. Now, in the early 80s, there was a, a spate of outrage in the United Kingdom over what were dubbed video nasties, generally low-budget films which featured lots of graphic nudity and violent content, which took advantage of the recent arrival of home video to secure an audience. No more did you need to go to some threadbare, sticky-floored cinema to watch purient content. You could get the sleaze right into your living room. Uh, now, this whole phenomenon was somewhat overblown, of course, uh, as is commonly the case with moral outrages. Uh, several now highly regarded films, such as Suspiria and The Thing, were caught up in the furor. Uh, but there were certainly films of the late eighties, late seventies, sorry, and early eighties, uh, that deliberately pushed the boundaries of what you could show in a movie to see what they could get away with. Uh, and this is definitely one of the latter kind of films. Uh, it ended up on what was called the Section Two list in the United Kingdom, which meant the police could confiscate it from any video store where they found it. Though as long as the store owner admitted that the film was obscene, they would not be then prosecuted for stocking it. Uh, it's an interesting uh, interpretation of the law, but there you go. So, what's going on with this movie? Well, uh, I mean, for one thing, it probably goes a long way to explaining why this film seems to have even more different versions than it does titles. Uh, there are at least five different cuts of the movie, ranging from 82 minutes in length to 103 minutes. Which version you choose to watch will determine how much graphic, deliberately shocking content you see. Uh, now, I've seen both the shortest and longest cuts of the film, uh, so I can confirm that the 21-minute difference in runtime is pretty much all graphic and deliberately shocking content. This includes the real-life mistreatment of animals, including killing at least one monitor lizard and one monkey, uh, as well as unsimulated sexual activity, simulated but gory torture and mutilation, and more. Uh, I'm not going to expand on what the more is, because there's a very real chance this would lead to the YouTube algorithms pinging this video for offensive content. Um, so for some reason you would find yourself watching this movie, pay close attention to the runtime. The longer it is, the more potentially offensive content the film is going to contain. Of course, Another important question if you do find yourself watching this movie is, like, will you actually be entertained as well as shocked? And the short answer is no. Uh, fundamentally, having elected to go with a shock factor to sell the movie, the filmmakers appear to have decided that that meant that they didn't actually need to bother with superfluous stuff like engaging characters or narrative tension or moments of humour or, well, anything to make the film actually engaging and fun to watch. Uh, the 82-minute cut of the film, which is the version I originally saw, is a truly boring, tedious experience. As I alluded to earlier, they even squander the opportunities presented by the lush scenery. 
Uh, the film was shot in the jungles of Sri Lanka, uh, but little of the natural beauty of the environment environment really makes it into the movie or is featured in any significant way. Uh, which is not to say that the longer cuts of the film are likely to be any more entertaining. Uh, I've not sat through every single different version, of course, uh, but for the sake of making my review of the film as complete as possible, I did track down and watch the completely uncut version, or at least the longest version, uh, and it's no more engaging. Uh, the intermittent insertion of deliberately shocking content doesn't make the rest of the film any less tedious. Uh, the confronting content is just kind of lumped in there with the apparent assumption that its shock value will also automatically make it interesting, and a, an assumption that, in my opinion, proves completely unfounded. Now, perhaps the most surprising thing about this film is the presence of two internationally recognisable actors in what is, frankly, a very deliberately and unapologetically exploitative sleaze fest. Uh, the first of these is the original James Bond love interest, Ursula Andress. Now, it's true that Miss Andress's career throughout the 70s saw her appear in a lot of low-budget films, all of almost which included her doing nude scenes. Uh, she apparently got tagged with the nickname Ursula Undress uh, as a result. Uh, but this film is still a significant escalation in terms of the severity of its overall content. Uh, the other recognisable name is Stacey Keach. Uh, his turning it up in something like this is perhaps on brand. Uh, Keach has certainly had a diverse range of roles in his career, um, ranging from the heights of TV success in the late 80s as Mike Hammer to slumming in direct-to-video Terminator knockoffs like Class of 1999. Uh, he also had some surprising roles he didn't take, such as turning down an offer to play the lead role in The Exorcist. That's a decision he probably regretted. Uh, but recognisable or not, neither actor can do much to elevate this film to watchability. Uh, it is, as a project, simply far too lazy in its script direction and production for that. Uh, it's a low and lowest common denominator kind of movie. Next time, we stay in the same decade with the 1973 offering Horror High. It's a horror film set in a high school, so I guess you have to give them points for the accuracy of their title. But that's next time. Until then, thanks for watching this video, and I hope you enjoyed it.